Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graphic Novels Program. My name is Sarah Burnett, and I serve as the Director of Operations for the Small Press Expo. Our Executive Director, Warren Bernard, was supposed to be here. He sends his regrets and requests for painkillers because he pulled his back out. I'm so pleased that I can stand in for him. I've got to tell you, it's tough to reconcile being someone who usually spends a Saturday afternoon curled up with a book, standing in front of a large crowd. <laughs> but I get the sense that you guys are my people, and I'm really glad we're all here today. The Small Press Expo, or SPX, has been proud to help organize the lineup of graphic novel authors here at the National Book Festival for the last five years. This year, we're particularly excited to support appearances by Tilly Walden and Ed Pisker today. Both have been mainstays at SPX. Our show this year is just two weeks away, and we'll feature many authors and artists you're familiar with, like Roz Chast, Jules Pfeiffer, Durf Backdurf, and Carol Tyler. We'll also have folks like Rebecca Sugar of Steven Universe fame, and Ngozi Ukazu, whose webcomic Check Please became the most funded webcomic Kickstarter of all time. With more than 600 creators on our exhibitor list, you'll discover a lot of new talent, too. I hope you'll join us just outside the city at the Bethesda North Marriott Conference Center on September 15th and 16th so we can continue celebrating great authors and artists like the ones you're about to get to know. There are some flyers that you can grab at the back of the room to learn more and hope you plan to join us. Now for while you're really here, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Kavna. Michael is the columnist and cartoonist with the Washington Post. His prose and pictures for the Post have been honored by the Society of Professional Journalists, National Headliner Awards, the Society for Feature Journalists, the Harvey Awards, and the Eisner Awards. This is Michael's fifth year as the founding MC and moderator of the festival's graphic novel stage programming. Please join me in welcoming him, and let's get started. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Thank you guys for coming out. Are you ready for two hours of comics? <laughs> this, this is the recess of the festival. This is when you were in school. You know, we can bring my post colleague, David Ignatius, you know, he's our social studies class and, uh, and, all, uh, and I sat next to John Meacham last night and we were talking about presidential history and he was reassuring me that 1933 wasn't so different from this year. Uh, and then we had a few drinks or a lot of drinks. <laughs> And I mentioned drinks because this was started based on drinks. Uh, it's it's the adult recess. Um, uh, this festival started, uh, you know, by uh, Laura Bush was really got it going, backed it. But for years there was no separate graphic novels programming. There were individual stages, and then you had some enlightened people talk to the Library of Congress, took them out for beers, got them a little drunk, and said, "You need comics." This is our fifth year doing this, so uh, for the grown-ups, alcohol can work. Uh, again, my name is Michael Cadna of the Washington Post. The Washington Post is a charter sponsor of this festival. I do want to uh, give a big shout out and thank you to the festival co-chairman, David Rubenstein, and all the generous sponsors who make this event possible. It's huge. And if you, perchance, would like to add your financial support, uh, so, you know, please feel free. There's information in your program about how to do that. And at the end of the two hour, near the end of the two hour presentation, we should have time for questions. We will have monitors, uh, I mean microphones right there. And, and, and just for everyone, um, the, this tape, this is being videotaped. So if you do appear or do come to a microphone, you may show up in a broadcast or in some other way. So uh, you're, you're agreeing. That's your consent if you dare walk up here. Um, the uh, one thing David Rubenstein did talk about last night was literacy, the high degree of illiteracy in this country. Also, just being a, a reluctant reader, we, so we often get teachers here. And for comics, it's very much the power of comics is to activate your brain. It's in, in, in different areas. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us, it, it triggers. You know, I've talked to students who it gets things going. So. A big reason we do this is because graphic novels and comics are huge to get young people to read. So we have, we have uh, several Eisner winner awards tonight. We have a big Rubin Award winner to my right, and his name is Mr. Patrick McDonald, the creator of Mutz. Can I get a big hand for Patrick <laughs> McDonald? Thank you. Um, 
Mutz, as you may know, was started in 1994. It's in more than 700 papers last I looked. Uh, you may have picked up some since we sat down. Uh, it's, just... Nowadays, it's a little tough to pick up newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as you know, Mutz is the lovable, sort of New Jersey world of, uh, of Earl and Mooch, the dog and the cat. Um, just to, to, as a baseline, do we have any fans of cats or dogs here? <laughs> really? That's a good. All right. I won't separate and say which is the better animal to own, but uh, you know, and you have is the the uh, it's it's a strip that is it's 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 special, and it's it's both it makes you feel good to read it, but it's also artistically the epitome of the art form. Uh, Charles Schultz, who we both would meet at National Cartooning Society conventions, he called Mutz, uh, and as you know, he was the creator of Peanuts. He called Mutz one of the best comic strips of all time. He said, Mutz is exactly what a comic strip should be. And Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, said, Mutz cheers me up every day. And I don't know about you, but some days these days, I need a little <laughs> cheering up in my morning newspaper. And so I turn to Mutz. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a tremendous feat, but he's also a children's illustrator. He's also a playwright. Uh, Mutz has spawned three books, I mean, many books, dozens of books, but such books as Year of Yesh, as it was, and hashtag I love Mutz and the Mutz Spring Diaries. Um, he's really the man who taught us how to say uh, yesh with an H and snacks with an X. <laughs> and uh, his, play, the, his book, The Gift of Nothing, was adapted into a play that played at the Kennedy Center that won Helen Hayes Awards. Uh, he also did the book Me Jane with, uh, about Jane Goodall and that won a Caldecott Award. So basically, you're just hitting on all cylinders these days. So one more hand, he's doing it all for everything he does. Thank you. So am I right, am I forgetting, is Mutz, will Mutz be a feature film? Is that gonna happen? Uh, knock on wood someday. Okay. Hollywood <laughs> works a little slower than uh, daily comic strips. Okay. Well, let's get, to, let's get to our images, and so, oh good, we do have the cover there. Can oh, you good. can see it, yeah. Good. Well, you know, I, I, much as a combination of my love for the art of comics and uh, my love for animals, so I, I, bought, I bought slides that show uh, my love for comics and my love for animals. Yeah. Now, you were an illustrator, you were doing things for the New York Times and, and many other publications before you launched Mutz. Were, I know I've talked to other creators who do prominent animals, and the animals were often popping up in their margins, or animal characters would just keep speaking to them when they would draw. When did animals sort of enter your page? Well, that's funny. I always wanted to be a comic strip artist, but when I graduated from school, I started getting magazine illustration work, and that kept me busy for quite, quite a few years. But in my magazine illustrations, I always drew a little white dog with a circle around his eye, just in the background somewhere. And um, I didn't have a dog at that point, but I really wanted a dog. And he didn't have a name, he was just this random dog. But when I finally decided I wanted to do a comic strip, um, I actually went out and got a Jack Russell Terrier, and his name was Earl. Wow. And uh, he inspired the comics. So the, the, illustrate, the cartoon dog I was drawing became a real dog, and then the real dog became the cartoon. Wow. And did that real dog demand royalties from the other dog? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're going to concentrate on a couple themes that consistently come up in Mutz. And uh, one of those, we spoke of Charles Schultz. And, uh, you know, there, sure. is, there is a through line. I mean, the fact that, that Sparky, is, as we call him, you know, he personally blessed your shit. Sparky didn't like everything, and he would let you know it, but he loved Mutz. So can you talk ab about, about sure. what you're doing well, here? I'll read this strip real quick. Yeah. Charles Schultz said, a cartoonist is someone who has to draw the same thing day after day without repeating himself. Yes, you can <laughs> say that again. <laughs> and then we have the follow-up. Charles Schultz said, a cartoonist is someone who has to draw the same <laughs> thing day after day without repeating himself. He said, what? Oh, man. I, I literally did that for a week. Wow, yeah. You and literally I, repeated yourself. Yeah, and then I enjoyed it so much, a couple of months later, I did a few more. <laughs> and I, I think I might have used it as much as I can. Okay, but, um, so this isn't appearing next week. Is it a, might. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, it's actually a great quote. And, uh, oh, Charles yeah. Schultz is the reason I became a cartoonist. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with Peanuts. And uh, the fact that I actually got to become friends with my hero and idol was... Uh, just amazing. And when he said he liked the mutts, I said, okay, I could retire now. Right, yeah, exactly. Instead, I kept on doing it. And it's, uh, actually, next year is going to be 25 years of mutts. Wow, congratulations. That's oh. a huge 
in this market and everything? Well, you, well, you know, when you think about it, Charles Schultz did it for 50 years. 50 so years. I'm only halfway there. I mean, really? So you're going to keep, okay. You're <laughs> okay. going to repeat yourself for 50 years. I'm not going to promise that. Okay. But so to continue the okay. theme of the meta here. Yeah, so do you have any ideas for today's comic? No, but I'm sure I'll come up with something by the third panel. <laughs> Boy, that got here fast. <laughs> Now, is that how you feel as an artist? Uh, you know, some like prefer the four panel thing. They like a longer arc to build to the joke. Uh, but some, you know, you're, you, you, you three panels seem to yeah, be Yeah, most of my strips are three panels. It's really, it's the classic way to tell a story. It's the setup and then, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the action and then the, yeah. pun, the punchline. Yeah. So three, three panels work, but uh, they do come fast sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will it continue again, the meta? Okay, Cat Comics by Mooch. Yeah. I'm thinking of making this into a graphic novel. <laughs> I bought this one because I was surprised when I was asked to be on the graphic novels panel. I don't, you know, uh, I'm doing a graphic novel, but it's taken 24 years to write. <laughs> and I thought Mooch would, uh, uh, if a cat did a graphic novel, just different favorite naps would be a, a good graphic novel. <laughs> and when, do, you know, the, the, the animal lisp is such a, a distinctive part, no one, no one does it like that now. Did that, was that organic from the beginning or? Well, you know, I was, well, I'm a big fan of old comic strips. Yes, And sure. old comic strips, people used to have little silly ways of talking. I mean, Popeye says I am what I am. Yeah. And Barney Google, you know, every, every, there was more of like playing with language. So I thought one of my characters should talk a little silly. Mm -hmm. And when Mooch came up, I thought he was the character that should talk a yeah. little silly. And I had a friend growing up who, whenever he got in trouble and had to admit to something, he would say, yes. Wow. And I thought, yes, would be a funny thing for Mooch to say. Yeah. And then I had him say, shmaybe, and then it just got out of hand. There you go. Shushing all over the place. <laughs> I literally once had a woman write me a two-page letter that said, uh, she she was really upset that Mooch talked like that. And at the end of the letter, her thesis was, her cat would never talk like that. <laughs> Yikes. So I wrote her a little note back, and I just wrote Shari. OK. <laughs> nice. I thought you were going to call the authorities, uh, maybe, on that. Uh, do your characters speak to you? Some, some creators have told me they know they're in the zone when their creators, when their characters are practically speaking to them. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's a corny thing to say, but the, the characters come sometimes do write themselves. Wow. Yeah. You know, the way I work, I'm, I'm visual, so my notebooks isn't, you know, writing as much as drawing. So I'll just draw Mooch and I'll think, well, what could he do and put him in a certain situation? And then he kind of takes over and tells me, tells me what to draw. There he goes. Okay. Like this one. Yeah. Think of a punchline. Oof. <laughs> and in a similar vein? Yeah, again, I've sent all, I brought all strips that talk about it, the yeah. art of comics. So yes. Mooch in the first panel, as he's a wizard here, Prospero. I will now cast a spell for us to travel back in time. Poof. Wow. I will now cast a spell for us to travel back in time. So it's, what's kind of interesting about this trip, you know, we learn to read comics. It's a, it's a very strange thing, but you know, each panel is a different moment in time and it's something that you have to acquire after yeah, a while. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a woman that I met who never read comics, so she couldn't, in the beginning, she really couldn't figure out what was wow. going on. But, wow. So it's something I think we just, we just learned, but it, yeah. it was fun to play with the concept of time in a comic strip. Yeah. And know, this is, I was reading something about the comic Norm MacDonald the other day, talking the platonic joke would be where the setup and the joke are almost identical. Well, if you were an anime, if you're a manga reader, you could read this right to left and it would work just <laughs> as well. It would literally, it's that circle, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a platonic strip. Sparky <laughs> really knew what the heck he was talking about, basically. And so, more so fun. So here's Prospero again. As the great cat wizard, I can see into the future. How does it look? Empty for now. <laughs> and then what, what other art form could you do this? Play <laughs> with the art form within the art form in this way. Um, oh, I love here's this. Here's one. Yeah. And the, this one isn't going to appear until next Sunday, so you're getting a, 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 tease. a tease here. All right. Varum. Okay, are they allowed to take pictures and post on <laughs> no, social don't. media? Yeah. Varum, what was that? Automatopoeia. Oh. Love that. I've been doing much for 24 years, and it's the first time automatopoeia was a punchline. Wow. And you're going to teach a few people, too. <laughs> they will, they will, the Google, there will be a Google spike for that on Sunday morning. 
Um, so another key theme and huge part of Mutz is not only the laughter, but, but the, the heart, the soul. And you, you, know, you have this uncanny ability in five panels or three to also just, just yank on our heartstrings so hard. It's a gift, it's, you, know, you, you really do it. And do, can you talk a little bit about just uh, the origin of this and the response you get from sure, doing sure. Shelter Stories? I'll read this one first. Yeah. So this is Shelter Stories Bowser. I was the first pick from my litter. My family thought I was the cutest little thing in a year I was gone. It was a matter of size. I got big and their hearts got small. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. You know, um, I was doing much for about four years, and, or maybe three and a half, and I was thinking that Earl and Mooch have loving guardians and a loving home, but I was thinking about all the dogs and cats in shelters that are waiting for that opportunity. And I, I was trying to, I was in my sketchbook trying to figure out how can I get shelter animals into the mutts world? And then a woman from the Humane Society of the United States wrote to me and said that November's National Animals Shelter Appreciation Week month, and uh, could I do something? I said, well, that's, that's the perfect opportunity. So I started Shelter Stories, which I do twice a year, one, the first week in May and the first week in November, to just remind the readers that if they're thinking about getting a new best friend, that the shelter was the place so to go. So you're funny, but you're saving lives, to be honest. <laughs> you're literally, you're, easy, well, you, you're a great spokesman, by the way. You know, uh, thank you. Um, you know, in doing much, I really, even though Earl and Mooch talk, I really wanted it to people to connect with their own cat and dog. Because yeah. if you have a cat and dog, you all know how funny they are. They all, I'm sure everyone's cat and dog can be a cartoon. <laughs> um, and, and they're based on my memories of different cats I've had and the dog and cat I have now. And um, you know, I just thought that I was trying to see the world through their eyes. And trying to see the world through their eyes, I realized how tough a lot of animals have it on this planet. So mm. I just wanted that to become part of Mutt's. Mm. Mm. Let's tell some more of their stories. Yeah, so this is Sky. Sure, I know I'm deaf, but I'd still make a great companion. Just do like I do. Listen to your heart. Oh, the faces. I put, I put, I put, I put yeah. that one in particularly because yeah. I got a letter from a, 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 a policewoman, and she said she just did a drug raid and in the drug raid, there was a, a deaf pit bull that um, she had to take to the shelter, but she was just really attached to this dog that she had to bring to the shelter. And uh, she, didn't, she didn't know what to do, but she came home, relaxed, took out the newspaper, and that strip was in the paper the day she did that. Oh my. And she literally went back to the shelter and adopted See? that dog. They named him Skye. So you You're never know how you might touch somebody. Saving lives, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. Okay. And this is another one, sweetness. Tom and Karina drove three hours to come and adopt me. They saw me in my shelter, uh, my, in my sweater on the shelter's website. It was love at first sight, likewise. Oh. And oh. this was another opportunity. Oh, I got to go to spend a, two days at the New York City uh, shelter and oh. uh, did stories about real things. And that was a real story. Someone drove three hours from Vermont or Maine, I think, oh. to adopt this dog in New York. Wow. Uh, chickpea and chickpea's brother. Well, the shelter's closing up for another day. We didn't get picked, I know, tomorrow, guaranteed. Oh, oh. I did this story about chickpea and chickpea's brother in the shelter, and at the end of the week, they didn't get adopted, and I got a lot of nasty letters. Oh. So a couple of months later, I had them both Came adopted. Yeah. Oh, oh. And guard dog, I always get letters about guard dog. They, they want me to free him, and someday I definitely will, but for now, I feel like he has a message to say for people who... Uh, chain their dogs and oh, hopefully oh. More, more and more states are outlawing that yeah so yeah. beware of dog i might break your heart <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, this is a strip i did a few years ago sweet dreams and in the first panel millie's petting mooch in her home but in the second panel we have pigs in crates wishing they were running free an elephant in the circus wishing he was running free chickens in battery cages wishes they were running free and Chimps in the laboratory wishing they were running free, and then ends with guard dog wishing that he was getting sweet dreams. What's mm -hmm. amazing about this strip, I did it quite a, like 10 years ago, maybe even longer, and uh, you know, progress. You know, the Arm and Bailey don't have elephants in the circus yeah, anymore. Yeah. Like, things so are true. definitely getting better, and there's optimism that the world will start having more empathy. Yeah, absolutely. And then here. I'm gonna get you. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Millions of chickens are kept in cages so small they can't even spread their wings. Now you know. Mm. And that was done, California was passing a proposition to uh, let 
chickens in cages actually have more space, and uh, so I wanted to be part of that message, and they actually uh, voted that through. Okay. So the power of the comic strip. Yeah. I'm going veggie. Yes. You, you've gone veggie yourself, right? Yeah, that's, I tell you, more and more I feel like that's what's going to change this planet. I mean, even if you just did Meatless Monday, you could help millions of animals. It's amazing how many animals are killed for uh, that. So I thought we could do that, that message. I, I started out with only, my wife and I, 40 years ago, or 30 years ago, said, um, let's just have meat one day, once a day. Mm. And then it, we came once a week, and then we just got off it. Now mm. we've been vegan for quite a few years, and it just gets easier and easier. We went to a great vegan restaurant right here in Washington, D.C. for breakfast, so wow. it gets easier. I think that's what's gonna change the yeah. world. There's yeah. more and more vegan products that everybody could yeah. enjoy. Yeah, we had to shut a few concession stands right out here when you came up, <laughs> just to make sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and then similar, you know, talking about the planet and, and just in uh, the, the larger picture there. Well, like, like I said, when you start seeing the world through animals' eyes, you see how tough it is. I mean, there's so, we have so much plastic in our oceans now, sea animals are, are dying from being choked mm -hmm. with plastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did this trip, and I, actually there's a, a guy in, I think, Arizona who just wrote to me that he's spending his life trying to, to solve that problem. Wow. And uh, he said it was because he was reading much as a kid wow. since he was five years old. Oh, so did you, you never know who you're going to, who you yeah. might touch. Did you mail back thanks? Uh, no, I'm going to send him okay. the original. <laughs> yeah, oh. So this is a comic I did a few years back where Mook Noodles says to, to, Stinky says to Noodles, yes, Mr. Noodles, sometimes I do get compassion fatigue. Gee, Jules, how do you get over something like that? Well, my autographed photo of Dr. Jane Goodall helps. <laughs> and that appeared in the paper, and the Jane Goodall Institute called me and said, could we put that on our newsletter? And I said, you can do anything you want with it, and I'd love to send you the original to give to Jane. And they said, well, Jane's going to be in New York next week. Why don't you just give it to Jane herself? And I said, oh, okay. Wow. So I, I got to meet Jane, which inspired me to do a, a children's book on uh, Jane Goodall called Me, Jane. The Caldecott Medal winning children's yeah, book. Yeah, Caldecott Honor Book. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And you know, it, it's, it's, it's a love letter to Jane, but it's, since we're here at the book festival, it's, it's a love letter to books. I mean, the power of books, you know, part of that, that's, that's an autobi a biography about Jane as a young girl. And she just talks about reading Tarzan and um, Dr. Doolittle. And it was, it was those books in her childhood that made her dream of going to Africa and working with animals. Wow. So, uh, boy, just the power of books. I'm sure everyone here has a book that changed their lives. And uh, yeah. I think that's why we come here and read. Yeah. Did you have a book that, or books that changed your life early on? You know, uh, probably Come Home Snoopy. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Now, you know, I, that, that was my religion. Before I went to yeah. bed, I read those Peanuts paperbacks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, was, that was what changed my, you know, like Jane. I mean, Jane at four years old knew she was going to do that. And I think at four years old, I knew I wanted to, to draw a comic strip. So. And then it all came together. Yeah, dreams can come true. Her Jane, you, Patrick. That's, <laughs> that's made for books. Well, it is now time to welcome two more nature lovers and animal lovers to our stage, uh, and, and they'll get a chance to talk with Patrick, too. Uh, the first is Tilly Walden, who uh, two years ago, 2016, you know, right up the road, we, we heard Sarah talking about Small Press Expo. If you live in the area, if you're around the area, there she is. Hi. Thanks, Tilly. <laughs> nice to well, let's get Tilly Walden and Penelope Baju. Thank you, guys. So while well, they get mic'd up, so Tilly, uh, if you get a chance to go to Small Press Expo, she won not one but two Ignatz Awards two years ago, and it's a great place to, to see who the, where the rising stars are. At the time, she was 20 and uh, just con continued to do great work. Then last year, she came out with Spinning, which just weeks ago won an Eisner Award, which is the Oscar of comics, so that's huge. Uh, she has uh, lived in a number of places, but uh, Texas is her home and where she was sprung. You went to the Center for Cartoon Studies to study with the great James Sturm, and it's a great, it's a great place. If, if you have a, a child or someone close to you and they want to become a cartoonist and get serious, the Center for Cartoon Studies up in Vermont is one of the great places to land. Um, uh, and so we have spinning and we also have uh, her new book comes out in October. 
uh, on a sunbeam, and I've, j I've got to read a preview of it, and I can't recommend it more highly. So uh, you've done four graphic novels. You had your webcomic come out. Uh, the great Brian K. Vaughn cartoonist said, Tilly Walden is the future of comics. And we have two people here who are the future of comics. With Penelope Baju, who uh, this is the third time I've had the pleasure of moderating you because she is a true rock star in comics. She's a rock star in France. She also is in a rock band, so that's, she has, she, that, is, that is she. Uh, she. Her blog, My Quite Fascinating Life, uh, started drawing great attention in France. Then she, you know, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this French. I had French, and I don't want to mangle one of your titles. But in English, it is brazen. Rebel Ladies Who Rock the World, which came out this year. Uh, one critic called it beguilingly brilliant. Wait, that was me. I reviewed it and wrote <laughs> beguilingly brilliant. <laughs> You know, to quote yourself is always good. Uh, but uh, she did, uh, it, she uh, came out the graphic novel Exquisite Corpse, which is wonderful. Uh, last year she was here for, for in the area for California Dreamin', which is the story of uh, Mama Cass Elliot, because even in France her parents would play American rock music on cassettes or A track, and she was hearing the mamas and papas. So Mama Cass Elliot, if you don't know, grew up in this area, was in Northern Virginia, then in Baltimore, and she beautifully tells you know, that story, and we'll talk about her new one. But one, while we're up here, so Patrick, we've heard how much he loves animals, and how much it, it, through his art you, you show that. Tilly's bio literally says, I love cats. It does. It does. I feel <laughs> like I should just be clear about it. <laughs> be upfront. So, and, and you have said, uh, Penelope, that you love nature shows. So can you talk, uh, do you guys, just a little bit about, uh, it, with animals, is there an animal that you turn to, either personally or animals, a breed that kind of inspires your art? I mean, I haven't asked you cat versus dog, because that's like, you know, the worst. We're already divided enough in this country. <laughs> I don't want to go there. But can you guys talk about the you know, animals and art? Do they inspire you? Yeah, I, uh, I'm obviously very inspired by cats. I yeah. think they're wonderful and fascinating creatures. And I think when you're drawing a story, especially a graphic novel, and you want to tell the audience something about your character, have that character interact with a cat. <laughs> like, I'm serious. It says a lot about who they are. You yeah. know, do they immediately go for the snuggle? Do they talk to them like they're a senator? Do you know, like, how do we, how do, we do this? And I love using animals as a way to express who people are. Yeah. Um, and how they show love. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there's a theory saying that if you want a character to look immediately mean and for people to hate him, he has to kill a cat. <gasps> and wow. if if someone kills I would a never cat, draw that. no matter wow. what you write afterwards, p your readers will hate him no matter what. <laughs> and it, or and if he saves a cat, then he's the good guy for the rest of the book. So that's a signifier what, yeah. how you treat a cat. Wow. Well, I know Patrick talked about you, you know the work you've done in terms of like uh, drawing about marine conservation and, and the planet. And you actually got, what, thousands of people to sign about, uh, it was had to do with, with oh. saving marine life, right? Can you talk a little, just a moment about that? Oh, yeah, there's a, um, a fishing technique, an industrial fishing technique all over the world called uh, deep sea fish trawling, yeah. uh, which is very destructive to the earth. And there was supposed to be a, a law that would be voted against this, and a lot of countries for not super clear reasons were against the banning of this. Yeah. And so I met this woman from an NGO who's been fighting against this all her life, but she couldn't really uh, make people care about this because it is not a very sexy subject, yeah. mm -hmm. honestly. So, yeah. And so I made a comic online about this because there was, uh, we were just uh, about to have a vote at the European Parliament about this. And so she made this petition online and she had a hard time yeah, raising attention from people. And so she had maybe, I don't know, I think it was 14,000 signatures to her wow. petition. So we made this comic online and within a month we had a million signatures. Wow. So wow. that was um, very, yeah, that was, that was nice, except that still they voted against it. Oh. Yeah, so, but that taught me a lot about how democracy works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's also the power of comics that you know, we, we talk to people at their level. It's like mm -hmm. more of a family conversation, and you can really uh, say a lot of important things that people will take easily. Then, yeah. you know, so that's the power of comics. You that, did a great thing. 
That's yeah. it. Well, on that note, we have to say goodbye to Mr. McDonald, but for Patrick McDonald, can we get a big hand, but also say a huge yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Take care. Thank you. So you can yeah, sit where you can, nice. however you want to. That's weird. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. We, no. Oh, wait. That's, a, that's a later show. And, uh, but cats, we need cats up cozy. here. Oh, no, we've ruined their whole setup for us. Sorry, I know, guys. I know. But. Uh, Rebels. Yes. So. You know, I, I don't know if you were anticipating, you know, even though the, the, hash, the Me Too hashtag was is a decade old, but where we are now, but the, the culture is just so, you know, so ready and hungry as ever to hear these stories. Uh, when you thought about, and, and obviously came out of France first, but with Brazen when you started this, did, were you sensing shifts in the culture or, or was your timing just impeccable? <laughs> Um, no, there was a long pre-process to it, yeah. so I, I would have loved to do this book 10 years ago, but yeah. it just had to, you know, mature a bit more. Yeah. Uh, but then, yes, obviously my editor wouldn't deny it, the timing yeah. was perfect, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's just that it took me a long time to gather all these stories, so yeah. Yeah. that was... 29, no, they're great, and it's a great array of stories. Well, let me ask, you mentioned your editor. Uh, you guys both are at First Second Books, which, you know, is, is a, just a marvelous imprint. Uh, what is in the water there that not only do they draw such talent, have such a great eye for talent, like such as both of you, but the, the editors seem to draw out that talent so well. What's First Second doing right in this time when there's so much great work is being done beyond the big two or big three when some people think of comics, but it's just great stories. I mean, you know, not to put you on the spot, but what are they drinking up there that's do that's going right? Uh, I think I think First Second really understands comics, yeah. and that's not actually a given with yes. a comics publisher necessarily. There yeah. are a lot of book publishers that now want to get into graphic novels, but they just don't understand that it is a, an extremely unique medium, yeah. very different from prose. Yeah. And I feel like at First Second, they have worked with so many cartoonists, they have published so many successful graphic novels that they understand what works, and they understand how cartoonists work. Yes. Um, and so it's a very artistic and kind of loving environment. Um, and they just, they have a great team. Yeah. And they all really care about comics, and they have good aesthetic, yeah. good aesthetics, good design. Um, yeah. I don't know what it yeah. is, really. Well, we know that France is one of the nations that truly appreciates comics. And, both, That's and, we know, and, and by the way, Mark Siegel at First Second Books, uh, with his strong ties to France, has a great tie. So he appreciates. So sometimes I feel like the United States is still trying to catch up with much of the rest of the world about appreciating. We are. Yeah. No, we We're, are. It's, it's going to take a while. Well, um, let's get to, to, to these stories. Um, and have you tell specifically about some of them. So here are, there are 29 stories total. And you know, you, you have to do, you have to tell these biographies quickly. And so your pacing is just magnificent. But uh, you know, and, and that, that's just beautiful. That's just gorgeous. So uh, can you tell me, this is Mae Jameson, right? The, the, first, the first black astronaut or the first black, black woman to go into space? Can you, can you tell and her? And to be in a Star Trek episode okay. at the same time. Really? Yeah. So can you tell, she what, was a Star drew, Trek fan and she, what drew you to her story? Uh, what drew me to her story? The fact that she was afraid of both height and darkness when she was a kid. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. And, yeah. and she ended up, you know, kind of nailing it. Yeah. That's the rest you can oh. say. Oh. And then, can you tell us, is this the, the, the rapper from Afghanistan? Yeah, this yeah. is Sonita Alizadeh. She's a, she's a young girl who was supposed to be married when she was 10 yeah. by her parents in Afghanistan. She grew up under the, um, the Taliban. And so she, and one day she heard an Eminem song on the radio. And she didn't understand the lyrics, but she really got um, struck by the rage in the way he was singing. And she said, that, that's what I want to do. So she recorded her own rap song about forced marriage. And she was back then living in Iran where it's uh, illegal for women to sing. Mm. 
and so she put it online. Mm -hmm. she, she shot a little video, music video on her own, and she put it online, and she was awarded a grant to go and study music um, in Utah. Wow. And so she had to escape her family to, to come to Utah to work on her rap. And she was 17 when she did that, which is such a lesson. Because wow. I remember what I was doing when I was 17. And what were you doing? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I was doing nothing, mostly. So. You were saving cats. Yeah, yeah, not even. I was watching TV, so I thought, yeah. And she's, she's now, she's, now uh, well, she's, she's your age. She's yeah. still very young. And, um, and she's, still, she's still going on stage now. Yeah. And to me, what's amazing is the fact she physically, her body was going to be commerce. At, by age 10. You're literally, that was her, her fate, unless instead she turned her mind into commerce and art. I mean, that's just a, a beautiful twist, and you tell it well and quickly. And is this Inga, or? Yes, it is. Yeah. And so what she, drew you to her story? She, she was queen of uh, what is now Angola, mm -hmm. and she was really smart, really witty, and she had a very dumb brother, but he became king because he was the only son, and when she was born, the woman who put her to the world told her father she will become a queen, and so she had her brother killed, uh, and so she became a queen. <laughs> now that's gangster. Those yeah. <laughs> and and she was a very good peace negotiator, and she was very fair and just, and she was amazing. And she said that she would never have a husband, but she would have many lovers, and she was really cool. Yeah. And she was a queen until the age of, I think, probably, well, it's not very well documented about this, but probably around her late 70s. And wow. she was still on the battlefield, on the front row wow. to fight. Wow. So she's super cool. A true woman warrior. Yeah. And this is the bearded lady, right, as she was billed. Can you tell us what, her story? Yeah. Uh, so her name is Clémentine Delay. She was uh, the first uh, bearded supermodel because she was a bearded lady, but she refused to be in a, in a circus, like in a, in a show, nor to shave, of course. And she said, I don't wanna be, um, I don't wanna be part of a, of a freak show. I want to be like a freelancer. And so she was selling her autographed pictures uh, to her fans. And then she started her own cabaret in the east of France. Mm. And she adopted kids and she was, she was really amazing, but she started her life by, of course, being shamed for her beard. And then she was um, offered as the only opportunity for a woman like her to be a, yeah, to be a freak. And that was early 20th century. So wow. there were not many other options. So, so far, every woman we're talking about basically was, had been assigned a role by her birth, essentially, and having to steer hard against that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there we go. I'll try this again. Look at her there. I love, look at that top panel. That's just beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that's her story. And even in France, she's not that famous, which I thought was very unfair. And that is the thing in common for all these women, I think, it's just that the reaction that I had mostly with this book was people telling me, wow, oh, how come I never heard of that woman? Yes. Even if she was like a Nobel Prize for Peace, because some of them are, and as usual, they are invisible. Yes. So I thought, in a very um, proud way, I was very proud when people said I had never heard about them, yeah. and that's my... Yes, yeah. and it's a great mix, because some of the people you may have even heard of, like Josephine Baker, known as a club and cabaret singer, or, or Hedy Lamarr, the actress, but we didn't know sort of when it came to World War II what they were doing, and whether in terms of uh, sleuth work, spy work, or technology, this whole other side that just never came to light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's beautiful. Look at her there. And then, uh, so this is uh, Las Mariposas, mm -hmm. right? Can you tell us about, was this uh, in their Dominican? Yeah, so there were uh, four sisters, but three of them uh, became resistant to uh, the local tyrant in the um, Dominican Republic. And what they had in common was that they were very smart, but they were also very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that man had the um, horrible habit of kind of going fishing for young, beautiful girls uh, to hang around with. And so he invited them over to his sort of palazzo and 
and he was hitting on them like very, very intensely. And that's what threw them into politics because they were so sick of being seen as a piece of meat yeah. that they decided to fight back the power and uh, they were put in jail, they were tortured, but they still uh, uh, fought him uh, with all their energy and eventually they were murdered. And today the International Day Against Women uh, violence, mm -hmm. violence, yeah, violence yes, against sure. women mm -hmm. yeah. is the day they were killed. Still, so, so they were, so they became martyred, martyrs. Yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. What? What about the fourth one? What happened to the fourth sister? She was, she was mild. <laughs> she was, <laughs> she was not that much into politics. I think. <laughs> mild? mild. Yeah, she was more. You know, yeah. she had more mild political stances, I think, yeah. than her sister. So, so these she, are the so, other two. So she got to live, basically. No, she no? died too. No. See? That's very so either unfair. way. So, <laughs> either yeah. Way. Yeah, I love the art of that. And there they are. Uh, let's see if there's, get to the, trying to get to the next one. Can we get to the next one? Oh, oh uh, Margaret Hamilton. Uh, now, I mean, I've, uh, I have relatives who talk about being scared as little kids when we watch Wizard of Oz and Margaret Hamilton and that green makeup and the poof and the fact that you get behind, you know, behind her story. What drew you to, to her story? Same thing. I was terrified by her as a kid. I had to leave the room every time for, with all the scenes where the witch was on. I had to leave. And then my parents would come, will call me to come back whenever she was gone. So I'm just curious. Anyone else here at all scared by the Wicked Witch in Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Wow. She, she was yeah. ranked uh, the fourth uh, worst villain in the history of movies after Darth Vader and I think Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, I was going to ask who's number one. It's Darth Vader. <laughs> oh, and they both got to wear masks. She was just yeah, and she's the only naked. woman. Wow. So <laughs> wow. The yeah. So and for a long time, I was really even just to see her face was too much for me. And wow. then one day, I, I heard that she was actually a school teacher to begin with, and that she loved children. And I thought, what a curse it must have been for her, <laughs> because for the rest of her life, she was, I think probably kids were running away screaming whenever they saw her. Yeah. And then I, I heard that she had been a single mom, struggling to get parts, and she wanted to play romantic roles. But all the um, casting directors told her she was too ugly to play that. Yeah. And so she thought, OK, then plan B, I'm going to be, if I can't be the pretty one, I'm going to be the scary one, because wow. I'm really good at being scary. Yeah. And so she heard that they were auditioning the part of a, of a witch in a movie. And so she went there, and she became the most famous witch in the world. So yeah. wow. wow. Yeah. And so I just want to let people know, we have just a couple minutes here with this to let, so, and who is this again? This, it's, it's Zinga that this is Zinga, mentioned before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's me. And that is you. <laughs> With my beautiful other picture. <laughs> you were voted the least terrifying woman in the world in the most recent book. Well, there, there's actually my story at the end of the book, which was not my idea, because I thought that was really pretentious. Yeah. But since we had to remove one story from the original, because yeah. it was originally 30 women, and one was removed for the American edition, because it was too hard, <laughs> so it was removed. And so instead, my editor, our editor, suggested that I put my own story in it, being told from the outside, which is a super weird experience. <laughs> so I wrote a two-page comic to explain how I was brazen and cool. <laughs> so it's horrible, but it's still in the book. Does that exist? Is that in there? Is that, is yeah, that it is. Yeah, it's yeah. the last two pages. And, it's, and then Penelope went on to become a blah, blah, blah. And I wrote this, so this is really okay. weird. OK, no, I read that. It just did, it, OK, it felt humble. It didn't feel pretentious. Okay, that's why. I, I was concerned. I thought there was a comic out there where it was like you were. No. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, with Tilly spinning, you know, this, this is such a, a beautiful work, a heartfelt work, deeply personal. I could sort of mangle it and try to say, explain in 30 words all. No, but the, but, but, but the trauma. I mean, what I will say is what you get, the, the sheer, raw, tender emotion. Um, as a parent, I've experienced it. You see a, a teenage girl when something that, when you're a little older, is just a mild thing, but everything new is just feels so immediate and can feel 
incredibly dramatic and your life is upside down. So when you're working, I mean, uh, you're a competitive junior skater and you are, you know, looking, having, uh, you're having skating with different, in the morning, see a different girl, one who's five years older and you're sensing a stirring and attraction. Oh yeah. Yes, oh, see right there, that oh yeah said more than my previous <laughs> 40 words. Please, get, you, you, you can do it better than can I. Can you describe spinning? You want me to describe, sp describe spinning and then what sort of, what it's like to be that personal on that level in, in art? Uh, it's kind of awful. It's yeah. very hard to make a memoir. I think no matter what age you are, it's very hard to look at yourself with uh, honesty and, um, and bravery. And spinning is, uh, it's, my, about my childhood. I grew up as a competitive figure skater. I did uh, synchronized skating as well. Not a lot of people know what synchro is. Uh, and I grew up in New Jersey and Texas, and I'm also a lesbian. And I felt like I was breaking into this thing where it was like, not only are almost all skating narratives just awful and yeah. really boring and yeah. stupid, and they end with them getting a gold medal and like, oh, look, a cute guy on the side of the ring. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, gross. Um, <laughs> That's not your rom-com. No, I was like, I, I've been, I grew up being so frustrated with skating media and very frustrated with sports media that I wanted to tell a story about what it means to grow up in a sport, what it means to grow up being pushed to do something that you are good at and that you also hate. Yeah. And then also to be a lesbian while doing that. Yes. And, uh, that, and discovering. And discovering that yeah. and figuring that out in the locker room yes. and trying to decide whether or not these girls would let me come back in this locker room if they knew I was a lesbian. Yeah. Well, at one point, I think you actually say you, you, you feared acknowledging you were gay or you feared that awakening. Or you even talk about fearing not writing gay characters because of that. Like you had to... Can, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I spent when I first started drawing comics, all my characters were little boys. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess they were straight. I have no idea, but it was all this just kind of internalized stuff. I spent my whole life seeing media that told these kinds of stories. So when I sat down to tell stories, I naturally I told I reflected them back. Yeah. The things I had seen. And you I, I think there has to be a moment where you say to yourself, "Hold on. What is important to me? What do I actually want to say?" And you have to push yourself yeah. to put that in your comics. Yeah. And I should point out, it wasn't just that you were skating. This was a 12-year saga. I mean, this is hardcore. This is. This I was is... skating far longer than I've been drawing. Wow. I'm a much more accomplished skater than I am an accomplished no, artist. No, no, no. But I, but I love the way you know different chapter titles that, that you the way you have Axel or Lutz or Counter. And so what that hammers home is it's not you describe the technical move but then you realize that's also an emotional state. Mm -hmm. And it, it just works beautifully on that level because you sense, uh, you know, it feels like as you're discovering it, we're so in the moment with you. We're feeling with you moment to moment. Oh, there's Lindsay and here comes Caitlin and there's Molly and, and there's, you know, and there's Ray and then is Grace sort of your nemesis? Would yeah. you say? Okay. Yeah. I mean, so some of the book is about bullying um, yeah. and, and things I experienced. Yeah. So, so here, the massiveness of a rink, and there you are back again, you talk about... Well, and what's strange is that I, I didn't use any photo reference for this book. Wow. I, because I, just, I wanted the drawings to reflect how I remembered things. Like, if you all think back to your childhood home, in your mind it's a lot bigger than it actually was. Because yeah. when you're a kid, everything seems huge to you. And I wanted... I wanted the scenes to feel like those memories, but that rink, mm -hmm. I drew it in this huge way, and when I finished the book, I actually looked up what it looked like. Yeah. It is that big. Wow. I wasn't wrong. Okay. It's huge, okay. and there's an American flag in it. Okay. I was right. So draw it when you're 20, not when you're 40, is what or you're saying. Or draw whatever you want. Who cares? <laughs> but your sense of it. And it's just, and you, you know, you, by the way, on a technical level, your grid work, you know, you, you, the way you'll do six panel, and then you, you have these 24 uh, panel pages. Oh, yeah. It's hard, on the ice, it's just heartbreak. I mean, you feel the immediate. It also reminded me, because I was a, just a, a, on a much less level, I was a competitive junior, as a kid junior tennis player, and, but I wasn't thinking about my makeup, and I wasn't, uh, you, you're, use your wording, I wasn't thinking about whether my crotch was showing as I'm doing a move, and I wasn't worrying about, uh, you know, just concerns that I've, I've covered both men's and women's sports uh, early in my career, and the difference, you make us aware mm -hmm. of, of everything in those, in those panels, 
and it just, everything feels just painfully, it, it, it feels like almost anything is a potential embarrassment. Well, yeah, and it's, it's a sport all about your body, yeah. and I was in it for, through my entire childhood, so yeah. my body was changing and growing, and I was having to experience that while in like a skin-tight dress with no underwear on, because skaters aren't allowed to wear underwear, because the judges might see it, like a line of it, and they were like, no, no. Um, and like having to understand your body while having an audience looking at it was like, but the thing is, it's, it's not just skating. Yeah. If you've been in dance, if you've been in gymnastics, yes. Um, I would probably say even tennis or even a lot of sports. Yes. There's, there's a lot of that. It's, yeah. it's, this isn't an isolated experience. Not, not at all, not at all. But to do it when you're young, to be, to have, mm -hmm. you know, you're not even 18, and uh, yeah. And so, uh, so you go from there. So you go from memoir to to fiction. And I then, wanted to perk up a little bit. Did you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and could, so could, and so this was, this was a web comic. This was an uh, uh, Eisner Award winning web comic. Was this, this is Ignatz Award winning I don't know, comic. I don't remember. Uh, they pile up, like your skating medals. At one point you say that you have an unhealthy amount of skating I medals. I threw them right? all out except for one. Really? I had so many, it was disgusting. My yeah. door actually broke because my mom used to hang them on my door and then my door broke. And I was like, this is like, yeah. this is stupid. Yeah, and it comes across in the book is like, not like, oh look at me, but oh my, like w literally weighing you down. With, the, yeah. with what you've been through. So can you talk about, um, th this book comes out in October. Mm -hmm. I can't, can't recommend it more highly. Uh, can you talk about transitioning to a work of space fiction? Yeah, I mean, it was easy. It was just like, let me shut down that part of myself that wants to like examine who I am and just tell a story about all the fun stuff that I want to do. And I would really like to go to boarding school in space. So <laughs> I, started, I started with that. Okay. I would also really like to live on a spaceship with a bunch of other queer women and just like be a little family together. So yeah. I did that too. Yeah. Um, and that's what the story is about. It's about this girl, Mia, and these two stages in her life, one when she is at boarding school in space and falls in love mm -hmm. uh, and deals with some things, uh, including bullying, and then uh, her, in her older life trying to understand who she is, not as a student, not as a girl at boarding school, but as a girl who is now a woman. Um, and it's long and fun, and it's still, it's still a webcomic. It's still for free. You can read the whole thing online mm -hmm. um, if you just Google on a sunbeam. On a sunbeam. And in Where did you October, get that? Oh, I have my ways. I just... Uh, you know, it's the patri patriarchy. It's, uh, I tapped it. <laughs> did I just say that out loud? Um, you did. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no, uh, it, what it is, it's partly the, it's the power of first second, but also the, the power of Small Press Expo, which will be in two weeks. Again, uh, they have helped make it possible to bring, uh, to bring Tilly Walden here, as, as well as the person who will follow us next, uh, Ed Piscor. You mean Ed? I mean Ed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, another thing is, what, what, one thing you guys both are drawing about and, and writing about is fear versus fearlessness, the fear paralyzing you versus people who seem like they just, it's, they seem able to conquer fear. And there's so much goes into that. I mean, you talk about quitting, and you thought quitting would be a big deal. You quit skating, and was it your mom? was like, eh, okay. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Everything you thought, can you talk, you know, in, in getting across that emotional state, just, just very quickly, can you talk about sort of tapping fear versus fearlessness for, in your work? I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a way to conquer fear. Yeah. I feel like all I can do is just try and work through it yeah. and try and understand it. Yeah. Um, that's all I really know how to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the fear will always be there anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably until the, the end. So yeah. I don't think there's a moment when you, you start not being scared anymore. So yeah. you just have to live with it and be able to work with it. Yeah. And the good thing is that it's not us, it's our books. Yeah. So yeah. we're not directly going to, towards um, you know, uh, people. And yeah. we have something in between, we have the books. So yeah. mm -hmm. we're safe. Yeah. And it's our way to process it. Yes. And art lets us deal with it. Absolutely. I just fear deadlines, I think, is what I end up fearing most, what I'm trying to, and I really mean that. Well, what that leads us to, speaking of Small Press Expo and, and, and someone along with Tilly who will be here in two weeks, someone who I first met at Small Press Expo six, eight years ago, uh, straight out of Pittsburgh, 
Uh, he uh, is a huge fan of, of, of Marvel comics and that 70s aesthetic. He's a huge fan of hip hop. He's a huge fan of so many things, but he's able to put it all in, in his art with this sort of uh, aesthetic that only he is doing. He is one of the very few, if not only, cartoonists working for one of the big two who does the writing, the drawing, both the penciling and inking. Uh, the color separation from end to end. He's, he's a, a, a one-man machine. Uh, growing up in Pittsburgh, he went to the Kubert School of Art, you know, started by the, J, the great Joe Kubert, if you know your stuff. Uh, he got to know, if you know, Harvey Picar, American Splendor. Uh, Eddie, at a young age, was doing that, working with on Macedonia and the Beats and American Splendor, our movie year. Uh, and so then he went to WYSIWYG, uh, which uh, was Eisner nominee. Then he did Hip Hop Family Tree. And this is, we'll get into how this is a work that, you know, you either have credibility, you have cred with the hip hop heads or you don't. And he got mad cred for that. And so what's coming up now is uh, he's been working on X-Men Grand Design and Marvel just threw him the sandbox and said, do what you want to do. And uh, so look, we're going to have two Eisner winners up here at one time. Please welcome Eddie P. Should we move over? I think he needs this mic. Ed, you need this microphone. Okay. And while he's doing that, uh, some of the praise for X-Men so far, it's been called a, a, a love letter to that era in comics. And it's been called the uh, intricate labor of love. And uh, it's just, it's, it's beautifully, it's done with such depth and you're able to get, capture that, that old marble aesthetic and, and it's, it's a masterpiece really. Um, I agree. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I want to ask you guys about is, is um, you know, it's, it's to different degrees, you're working with editors, but when you're telling personal stories, you need certain amount of freedom. Do you feel like once you have a vision uh, do you feel like you're able to sort of push back against editors or convince them or be persuasive and say, here's the vision I have, and are there ways to do that where they respect you creatively? Uh, there are ways that they respect you creatively, and by way of Hip Hop Family Tree being a New York Times bestseller, uh, <laughs> they, they seem to trust that I'll be able to uh, sell them books. You know, yeah. like. Uh, when it comes to that realm of corporate comics, yeah. which, which I'm not very familiar with, I'm just kind of visiting, yes. um, it's all about the money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like, the things that I'm doing are not so controversial that they really, I really need much of their input or whatever. Yeah. Um, and to some extent, in that universe, I, I am a little bit of a prima donna where- Are you? I would <laughs> like to just uh, work on my own stuff in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, so you know, if they push back too much, then I'll just go back and do my own thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do Hip Hop Family Tree Volume 5 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like my editors know a lot more than me at times. Really? Yeah, I'm very much like after I do the first draft and they like look at a scene and they're like, uh-uh. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. you're probably right. So you're saying you're not a prima donna? I guess not. Okay. <laughs> I guess I just, I, I know that I, I'm so biased. Okay. I can't look at my work critically at all. So, yeah, you, you rely on some of the critical distance. I do. Say, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. have to. Yeah. And Penelope? Oh, yeah, I totally rely on my editor. I give him half of my brain when I begin the book. He knows where I'm going. Okay. And at some point, he knows better than I do because he remembers my original idea where I'm totally lost and confused along the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's like, focus, remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. So, yeah, I totally need him, too. Yeah, you know. To me, often there's, there has to be one point where, you know, you, you uh, just feel like when you're writing, you trust your voice, you know your voice. Have all three of you gotten to places where you know your voice, you know, because we all have, we're influenced by different writers and artists early on, but then you learn to trust something inside gradually emerges. Do you feel like you all have reached a place where you just, your voice is your voice and you are very comfortable in that place? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. At yeah. least, yeah. yeah. It took me a really long time. I think I was like 27, already yeah. in the game for like six years when wow. I finally accepted who I was. You know, yeah. I was always trying to make comics like, like this or like that yeah. because there was no empirical data that the things that I like, my taste levels would resonate on the shelves because I had nothing to point to. So yeah. it took a lot, of, a lot of trust in myself to get to that level. Yeah. Um, it yeah. took a while. But you're there. I guess. Okay. 
Yeah, never satisfied. Okay. Well, since you're not satisfied, you have to stay with <laughs> us. So you have to stay after <laughs> class. Again, recess. But you guys, thank you so much. Tilly, Penelope, please give them a big hand. Thank you so much. You're so good, You're so good at this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. There he is. There he is. Man, this book is beautiful. This is just a gorgeous. You know, I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to find this book because. And you've got a, you had a new one just drop, right? A new, new X-Men? new issue just dropped, and uh, the, ne like the second big book will come out at the yeah. end of October. Yeah. That was the cool thing, too, like dealing with Marvel. It, it, yeah. Like, they accepted the format changes I wanted to make. Yeah. Generally speaking, all the Marvel books are of a piece. They look yeah. the same. They, they fit yeah. next to each other on the bookshelf. Uh, but my ego doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I You're, wanted the book to be big and giant. And yeah. uh, if they were going to use my, my full superpowers, they have to let me design it. Right. Yeah. Um, so they were accepting of that, too. Tell me, you know, we talked a bit about this, but how does this happen? I mean, this is Marvel. And, and for them, it's one thing to hire a writer it's a, or an artist and say, hey, we, we like your stuff. You want a shot at writing a, a limited run on X, so to speak. But to say, we're going to let you really play in a huge sandbox and trust you to go to town, I mean, it's, 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 it's a rare thing. Uh, how, how does that happen? When I, uh, I got the Eisner Award for, um, I think it was the second volume of Hip Hop Family Tree, yeah. and you're there at the, at the event, they call your name, and as I was walking up, I didn't quite feel the feeling of satisfaction I've been searching for yeah. my entire life in this game. Yeah. And I didn't want to do Hip Hop Family Tree anymore, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I had about 10 pages to go on the fourth volume, and I go up there and accept my award, and I'm like, ah, this didn't give me what I, this trophy's hollow, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, the ultimate metaphor you hoisted at the event, you haven't even left the San Diego Comic-Con Hall, and you feel hollow. Totally. Okay. Um, so I put a tweet out there. I, I drew just for pleasure for like the first time in years, and I decided to draw this, this elaborate picture of the X-Men because like as a kid, I liked the comic or whatever, and I've been so far away from those kinds of comics. Um, I d decided to just draw this thing for fun. Uh, since I had developed some skills, I have never drawn any of that superhero stuff, and it was a lot of fun. Put a tweet out into the universe and said, Marvel should just let me make whatever kind of uh, X-Men comic I feel like making, just like that. So you weren't even tweeting at Marvel. You uh -uh. were just tweeting to the universe, so to speak, the yeah. Marvel universe. Yeah, because I, I never thought about doing work yeah. for, for yeah. Uh, Marvel in any way. Like, as a, as a cartoonist, you make comic books. Yeah. Like, you don't need to be paired up yeah. with a, with a sure. writer or artist. You, you know, do it like, all. Just, yeah, so I, I make comic books. So how long did it take to hear from Marvel? Like an hour. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> The game has changed. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And I, I, I let them know that, you know, this is what I would do. Um, the X-Men, for those who don't know, it's a very, very uh, sprawling, kind of convoluted narrative. It goes all over the place. And, and um, there's a lot of confusion in those comics, yeah. which is actually kind of like what I liked about it yeah. when I was a kid. But yeah. it takes a lot of work yeah. to, uh, to parse through all of that. Yeah. So my idea was to take you know, the first 30 years of those comics. That's yeah. the stuff that I liked when I was a boy. Yeah, this is Chris Claremont stuff, right? Yeah, the Chris Claremont era. Yeah. When, when X-Men fans comics. here and fans of, <laughs> yes, nice. Whoa, way more than I thought. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, when he left the series, I left the series and, yeah. and graduated to, you know, Fantagraphics and yeah. stuff like that. So, so they liked the idea and um, I'm quite sure that they would have liked me to have done it you know, inside of a year yeah. or something, but 240 yeah. pages, doing the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah. It takes a while, man, so it's oh, yeah. three years. Yeah. I'm, no. I'm good for like 80 to 90 pages a year. You know your rate, you know how to yeah. pace, you know yeah. how to pace. Well, let's talk about Hip Hop Family Tree. I mean, this is just from Fantagraphics. It's, you know, it's just gorgeous, but also, um, like, I, I have a Post colleague a uh, Washington Post colleague who is working on a big hip hop book now that came out of an article. And whenever you, it, you know, hip hop is still, people are so passionate about it. And even though it's been around for so many decades, so many as aspects of it feel so fresh to people. 
that they, you really can't get it wrong. If you get anything a little bit wrong, you're gonna hear from it. So credibility is everything to starting out. And so you had to really do your homework. I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't just wiki that. No. You really, can you talk about, this is a, just from a research standpoint, was a mammoth undertaking. Can you talk about doing that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, with, uh, with both of these projects, there's just all this back-end work that um, doesn't, doesn't get seen on the page. Yeah, and with, all behind the curtain. Yep, and with Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, you're right, you have to have some credibility, and, and it has to feel organic, it has to feel authentic, man. Mm -hmm. Like, that phony stuff will not fly. Mm -hmm. um, so, my kind of solution to that with Hip Hop Family Tree was to kind of dole the, the strips out uh, mm -hmm. online first, mm -hmm. to um, just have even a fresh set of eyes. Like, y you know as well as I do that yeah. um, the anonymous commenter on the internet is very quick and happy to let you know yeah. if slash when you got something wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to say that that just has never come up uh, wow. in, like in the comments yeah. on, on uh, That's amazing. online because I really did try to make my, my research as bulletproof as possible. Yeah. And, and uh, when we first met, you, you brought up the, the, the word like journalism and, yeah. and uh, using a journalistic you process. You doing comics things. journalism. And I never yeah. thought of it as that. I yeah. just uh, didn't I just wanted to have artillery in the pocket in yeah. case somebody yeah. said something weird, and then I could just like present the materials that I used to to uh, put my. Well, comic here's together. the thing. I mean, and we know beefs are still happening about who gets credit for what, right? I mean, we can't Stephen resolve talking about Marvel Comics what Stan Lee gets credit for versus Jack Kirby versus Steve Ditko or or Gene Colan or, or Marie Severin who just died. Uh, yeah, rest may in she peace. rest in peace. She was legend and she was there. She worked her way up from colorist all the way up to co-creating Spider-Woman. Or, you know, we just lost the Marvel editor and, and creator uh, Gary Friedrich who co-created Ghost Rider. So if you can't parse that out in, a, in the Marvel method system, hip hop trying to parse out who gets credit for what beat and doing what when they're all in that creative cauldron at the beginning. And you, in some ways, are having to officiate. You're kind of drawing that as kind of refereeing that a little bit. Yeah, but I hedge my bets in ways, too. Okay. So like in that first hip hop book, yeah. uh, I believe there are no less than three or four guys who I allow the space to uh -huh. um, claim the creator of nice. hip hop. And then did you ever hear from one or the other, like, hey, that's, that's not my take? Uh, sure, yeah, like yeah. Uh, there would, I would, after the first volume, um, which was largely constructed from found materials, yeah. um, that's when I started to get the calls and, yeah. and, and about just like, okay, when you, when you start to cover me, like, let's yeah. talk, yeah. and then, and then uh, <laughs> you know, I'll give you the full story. Yeah. But the way that hip hop works, so you have your, you know, Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours in, in interviewing. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so these, these guys were trying to run all over me. And uh, the way hip hop works, you have to puff your chest out and, and you have to take command and you have to be the alpha dog. And I just know that I was being told fictions. Yes. Um, and I would just say, like, man, that's a wild story. I love it. Yeah. Is there anybody else on this planet who could corroborate what you just told me. Yeah, second source. Anybody else, yeah. man. And, and it would always come back sort of, no, oh, you don't believe me. And it's just yeah. like, ah, it was pretty wild, man. Yeah. And, uh, so you're getting fake news. Fake news. Okay. <laughs> yeah, before it was trendy. <laughs> well, can you talk about, I mean, you ended up, uh, you're either going to hear back, you're going to hear in back one way or the other, and not just from anonymous commenters. You're going to hear back maybe from an ice cube, maybe from a grandmaster flash. Can you talk about what it was like to have certain people really who were there in the closer end of the beginning or who were really big and say you got it or just even offhandedly go look at this what was that like oh it was, it was an incredible uh, you know I operate in a vacuum um, I don't work closely with any editors or anything yeah. like that my entire process has always been just sit down make the comic see which publisher likes it the best yeah. and then uh, move forward from there yeah. so Putting the strips out online, it became a really fun game almost week in, week out, yeah. where um, I would just kind of look online and see, oh, uh, so this famous rapper uh, tweeted the yeah. comic or yeah. that. I mean, the success of the series is really, in, in, thanks in great part, to the kind of word of mouth yeah. that, you know, what's, Ice Cube. Uh, what's, yeah, I was going to, what's one of the coolest things you saw? It was like, whoa, okay, so-and-so. 
Yeah, yeah well, this yeah. photo right here, man, yeah. this is Fab Five Freddy, the host of UMTV yeah. Raps yeah. Uh, from when, you know, I was a kid. Like, yeah. you know, when I, I didn't take this photo. Yeah. You know what I mean? This was yeah. just something that was online yeah. that, that, you know, I was tagged in on Twitter or something like this. So when I see things like this, it blows my mind. Yeah. The most popular strip was definitely this one that I did about um, how Ice Cube met Dr. Dre at like a uh, backyard cookout in, in the uh, super early 80s. And uh, when Ice Cube spread, spread the strip out, like on his social media platforms, yeah. you know, his people or whatever, yeah. um, he took ownership of it. So he said, hey, read this comic about when I met Dre. Yeah. So it wasn't like, look at this bullshit. Yeah. You know, part of my French. <laughs> Um, it was like, yeah, this is, check out this comic yeah. about when I met Dre, and it just, it spread like wildfire. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing, the kind of recommendation, like when you say to a friend, you know, that isn't, you don't need a hype man, that's just a friend saying to a friend, check this out. Yeah. Which in a way has a lot more, you know, a lot more influence. Never took it for granted, man. Yeah, yeah, it's a way to do it. So look at that, and look at, now, am I wrong, you know, so you're nodding to Marvel, is that a little bit of like a Kirby crackle there, a little, a little nod to Jack Kirby? Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure, at, at any moment. It's like, I wanted this comic to look like it was ripped from that time period that yeah. I was covering. So you it's like late 70s, early 80s, and yeah. try to capture that aesthetic as much as possible. Yeah, and you even captured, like, you didn't want to do it on a slick white paper. You wanted that sort of tan, weathered, six-month-old comic book aesthetic, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I just like uh, I just like that look and feel of a well-read old comic book. Yeah, yeah, which in a way too is great because we old album covers, you know, they get a little weathered, and so part of it you feel like you're like holding a weathered comic book, but also some of these are so evocative of the time, you feel like you're holding an old album cover. Do people remember vinyl, or new people use what buy vinyl now? Down down to the paper that the those books were printed on yeah. um, was a design choice that I made. Like yeah. I, I called and got in touch with several Chinese publishers yeah. to uh, try to get the exact perfect paper. And the biggest compliment um, whenever I'm at a signing or anything like that, when yeah. I see people kind of like rubbing my books, like even subconsciously, <laughs> um, yeah. it's a big compliment. And yeah. if, if we're going to you know, chop down trees to make books, like might as well make very tactile experiences like the most beautiful books possible. Yeah. And I should read that, that uh, reminds me all these authors will be signing. So if you haven't gotten the, you know, you should go to their signing. Uh, when is your signing, by the way? I think it's like 530 to 630. Okay. So if you go to a signing, make sure to rub your book and, and, and it'll check it out. <laughs> So. Well, now that, that would just be pandering now. You don't have to. <laughs> it, it would. So, but you can see that weathered aesthetic. But, uh, but I mean, so can you talk about, you know, you're, you're evocative of, of Claremont's X-Men and getting the play with the superheroes. And, I mean, you really, I think it seems like you're referencing, um, you might, like, hundreds of comics and dozens and dozens and dozens of characters. I mean, you're going deep with little nods here and there. You talk about, it seems like, like hip-hop uh, family tree, you're, you're really, you're going deep with the knowledge. Yeah, I took about um, 8,000 pages wow. of, of material. Wow. Um, you know, it's 30 years of comics, not just from the main series, but there are tangential series yeah. and all sorts of things like that. Uh, about 8,000 pages of material, cull all of that down into um, a 240-page story with a satisfying beginning, middle, and ending. Wow. You know, like yeah. not that bait and switch of cliffhanger at the end, yeah. come back next month, yeah. see how they get out, out of that scrape, yeah. leave on another cliffhanger. Um, so I, when I started this project, I, got, uh, I bought the, the biggest kind of... Uh, bulletin board that money can buy. It's like as, as big as a, as a school, as a elementary school chalkboard. Uh, yeah. And I just sort of put it on its side and got all these note cards as I was making notes along the way and, and, and you know, red yarn string from this push yeah. pin to that one and this very... Almost like uh, the way you track a mob family. Exactly. Yeah. It, like, yeah, it was like, like you know, the, yeah. the, the Barksdale family tree yeah. or something like that <laughs> yeah. in The Wire. Yeah. And, but it would be these these phrases that would just sound um, totally insane, read, read all by themselves. So, so like I was praying that, you know, I just wouldn't die in a car crash or something like that. My parents have to 
have to clean out my house, and then they see this bulletin board <laughs> full of these, these notes that say something like, uh, the Shadow King was sexually transmitted to his son. Or, and then like, you know, they, my parents might think that they, uh, they dodged a bullet, you know, yeah. it's like, oh, it's good. <laughs> It's good. We, he's, he's, he's off the streets. But then they would say he was a cartoonist, and that explains it all. You get away with so much when you're a cartoonist, right? Your research material. But, uh, I mean, and this is just gorgeous. Do you, do you have a favorite X-Men artist? I don't. Uh, yeah. Like, like uh, they definitely, they being Marvel, yeah. definitely hired the, the top talent of the day yeah. um, to, to draw their, their comics or whatever. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I, you know, there's a, a million of those guys that yeah. I like, and it's all for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. So you were nodding. So was there, when it comes to the X-Men, if you had to bookend certain years that really influenced you and you really were nodding to more than others, what would you say, sort of a... You know, I don't know what years these things came out, but, but uh, it would be issued like say 108 to okay. 137, okay. late, late mid 70s, yeah. um, the, the John Byrne, Chris Claremont era. And that's, yeah. that's the, those are the comics that all of these movies kind of derive from. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of think of uh, that, the stuff that Chris Claremont did in his early, early career on the X-Men, yeah. um, he created a pretty astounding piece of uh, kind of modern mythology. And, yeah. and a part of my take on this project is um, the way mythology works. It has, to, it has to be kind of reinterpreted, almost like a sort of a game of telephone. Yeah. So in a world now where, where I see, like just walking here, like I see people with like Avengers shirts on yeah. and like when I grew up, like Avengers was as corny as can be. Like yeah. the X Men, yeah. the X Men were like the pirates, and the Avengers were like the Navy. Yeah. Uh, so I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, hold on. <laughs> she, she, well, I'm just yeah. saying, like they were just more punk rock, more more yes. outlaw. Yes. So I just have to remind everybody, like, kind of yeah. how cool the X Men are. Yeah. No, Avengers Assemble sounded cornier before. And are you a fan of the? I mean, uh, I, I mean the Avengers. Yeah. Are, are you a fan of the X Men films at all? I've seen them all, but I kind yeah. of like as soon as I leave the theater, I forget about it. Yeah. You yeah. know, just go there with friends to yeah. kind of hang out. I, I like it at the time, but yeah. I'm not. I'm not one of those people who. Um, sees a movie that's based off of a book and, yeah. and I complain that like, oh, yeah. they got it wrong. Like, yeah. it's a different medium. Yeah, your childhood wasn't ruined. <laughs> that's, and that's what I say to people like the, the, the old kind of like basement dwelling neck beard yeah. guys yeah. who, who uh, mess yeah. around. Like, yeah. I'm like, listen, I'm not coming to your house and burning your old comics. Yeah. Like, if you don't like it, just don't read it. <laughs> okay. So we apologize if you were in the Navy and are a neck beard guy. <laughs> the twofer. We're really... No, the Navy's cool. Yeah. No, I'm just the saying Navy's it's school. It's, I'm Even just saying it's squ you know, square. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, you, we talked about you getting, uh, you, I, I know you don't, you don't need affirmation, but getting confirmation from the hip hop community uh, from old X Men guys who worked on the X Men books and, uh, or anyone else from the Marvel world. Have you gotten sort of that kind of, uh, I don't know, if not affirmation, but just sort of positive reaction? Uh, the answer would kind of be uh, not no, but it's just, uh, yeah. it's just like a baseline. Like yeah. I, I got to spend a lot of time with, with Chris Claremont mm -hmm. and my approach when dealing with him, uh, now Chris Claremont wrote this comic for sev like almost 17 years. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's his baby. Um, so my approach when dealing with Claremont was almost like, I felt like I was kind of dating his daughter. <laughs> Um, so I just, as a student of this form, you know, yeah. I, I don't pretend to know everything, and I, I consider myself to be a student. Um, I shut my mouth, I open my ears, and, yeah. and I just receive information, you know, yeah. so it was, you know, senpai, kohai kind of yeah. yeah. thing. Yeah, and uh, in terms of the, of, the, of the artistic, I mean, how did you approach, are there certain ways, you know, you're, you're so specific, you, you remind me like when I talk to someone like Chris Ware, and if it comes back, for, if it ships back from, say, China, and just, he can see, you know, a color is just, sla on page 93, uh, building stories, just something, they didn't quite nail it. Um, it. But now, instead of, like, working with Fantagraphics, working with Marvel, when it comes to the art, the printing, lettering, is there anything, to, are, does it all feel the same, or is there something you've had to adjust to? It feels pretty much the same, but yeah. the thing is, um, you know, working with a Fantagraphics, um, you're, I get to work with the, the people who have kind of skin in the game, so to speak, yeah. like the people who are there, like investing their money into the product, yeah. and, and they want this book 
to to be true to the vision that it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, with Marvel, it's been a long time since you know Martin Goodman was there, and yeah. then the closest relation to the originator was Stan Lee, yeah. and he hasn't been in the mix for a really long time either. So yeah. it's all um, you know, it's just, just people who are going to their their job. Yeah. They have a certain passion for it, yeah. but you can absolutely tell the difference. Yeah. That yeah. Um, that uh, like uh, you know Disney money is being spent on this yeah. rather than like the money from my own pocket kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, that said, yeah. the people that I work with there yeah. are totally behind me making the most beautiful books that we can. Yeah. So we're able to get, um, we're able to get you know, uh, proof copies ahead, way ahead of time so yeah. that I could adjust things nice. and, and um, you know, have a lot of say in the, the paper stock. Like all, all of the, these kind of back end elements to just try to make like a really solid um, yeah. unit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and these covers, and so to have such control over the covers, because you know, you have top writers and artists working for the big two, they, don't, they might not have any say over the cover. So the fact that you get sort of uh, not only, you know, beginning to end process and cover to cover, it's all you. Part, yeah. of, part of the idea is to, is to make these, this grand design thing kind of the definitive X-Men uh, X -Men comic, a comic that you could point to yeah. and give somebody if they were curious about the X-Men. And now the comic books have different covers than what we're seeing up here. Yeah. And that, those comics have a dif different kind of distribution mechanism. They go to comic shops. Yes. So yeah. the guys at the comic shops, they want to see cool costumes and, and um, you know, muscles and whatever. Yeah, sure. um, these books are, are in uh, sh regular bookstores, yeah. you know, at yeah. Barnes and Noble or whatever. Yeah. Um, so what I want to communicate with the covers of, of the big books that have like a wider distribution, yeah. um, I need to get the concept across like as fast as possible. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the spirit with these things. So it's less about just, um, you know, putting, stacking bodies and yeah. fight scenes or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, just communicate the idea in as quick a fashion as possible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Rob Liefeld, the, the Deadpool creator, I mean, what he called the way you did this, he calls the perfect primer, or some people say primer, for young and old, if you want to learn X-Men. Do we have anyone here who considers himself young? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, how, about, how about old? Anyone consider old? But we, got, we got a lot of middle-agers. Yeah, seems. wow. That's, <laughs> so this book, no, this book is so for you. It's just, it's, it's just beautifully done. So, you know, uh, is it... Is it I, knowing how you work, you know, you're not the type to sign a, an Aaron Rodgers deal and commit yourself to, or Tom, you know, to, to Marvel for five years. You're not going to do a James Bond thing and be locked in. What, how, how far out do you see going with Grand Design? I'm working on the last two issues. Okay. Um, it'll, it'll take me until next summer. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's, this is what I have to offer them. Yeah. You know, like I, yeah. I try, thankfully, the hip hop family tree thing really blew up in a way that I could really pick and choose what I'm going to end up doing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, this is what I could offer them. This is all that I have yeah. to, to kind of give them. And I have to go back and just uh, get these ideas that I've been having in, in my head to get, get them out there on paper. Yeah. This is an example of one of the yeah. comic book covers that would, would be in the comic shops. That's just beautiful. And so that was that your idea to kind of have these, these covers that, you know, the, it actually wasn't like that. Was like a really great contribution of of the editor. Um, yeah. I came I came up with some ideas that that ended up being variant covers or whatever. But yeah. when he, when he said, "What if we do six interconnecting covers that yeah. just kind of show the whole tapestry?" Yeah. Was of, this uh, Axel Alonso or somebody else? It was it was my direct editor named Chris Robinson. Okay. Good guy. Shout out to Chris Robinson. Yeah. And when he came up with that idea, is it was it was yeah. a bit. These are just beautiful, just gorgeous, and look at that. I mean, that, you know, the depth of field, by the way, you're able to achieve, that, you know, that's a long time. That's, that's, yeah, thanks, that's, man. that's decades of skills right there. Yeah, I guess, man. We've yeah. known each other a long time, Mike. God damn. <laughs> you know, you, like you said, been in this game a minute. And, but look at the, the, the texture, the, the, the feel of the Bende dots, you know, on there. And, and yeah, once, heart, a, once again, doing, doing everything I can to try to make it look like it was a comic rip from that that time yeah. period. Now this panel would have been maybe one of like 10 panels on a page. Yeah. So it's a very, very small panel. Yeah. So that's why she looks like she has measles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because it was you're, very, very tiny. You're approximating the tech of the time. Yeah. You know, what you had. It's very Lichtenstein blown up. Yeah. Way. And the classic snick to Wolverine, just even nodding to that. I love that. 
when Wolverine was still, you know, closer to five feet than six feet and uh, low to the ground. Yeah, and look at that. Oh, that's just gorgeous. A little more Kirby crackle popping there. Yeah, I'm learning a lot just in terms of like drawing this like action stuff that I yeah. never even thought to draw. Yeah. yeah. It, it, everything I do is kind of just like an education. Yeah. And uh, playing around with this superhero stuff, it's like now I now I can't really like fake my anatomy as much. No. You know, like no. You know, like I would I would be raked over the coals no. by the superhero fan. So it's like I'm kind of learning on the job yeah. to try to get more dynamic and oh yeah whatever for yeah. this project. You know, yeah. of course is required for this, but. Yeah. Now, if you're going to like foreshorten an arm or do something like that, you're going to have to to nail it. And and you know, Kirby could go bold, but uh, still had to be true. No, this is just look at that. That's just that's gorgeous. So what is what's next for you? Because I know every every project for you is a project of passion. It's true. Yeah. Do, I, do you know what's coming up on for you? I definitely do. And there there's it's a subject matter that's really not been covered much in con it's very. There's some new stuff that's happening in our culture. Yeah. And I just don't want to say it because I can't let some other schmuck beat me to it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I do have ideas. I have a ton of them. I've been taking notes, putting, yeah. putting things together ahead of time. So it's like I have 62 more pages to draw. I could do two pages a week. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, once I get done with this, I'm going to just probably go to Japan for a month and, yeah. and, and check out the scene there and then nice. come back and nice. get busy. Nice. Well, do you... Uh, Early on, you were collaborating, Picar, Harvey Picar, and other people could, but now you, you know, you have the uh, creative control to your own thing. Could you see a situation where you were collaborating again, where you're turning over part of it to someone there, else? There are three people who I would work with, um, uh, like off the top of the bat, like, and, and they're the, the top dogs as far as I'm concerned. And you can tweet this, and within an hour, maybe they'll respond. Yeah, to maybe. Uh, yeah. Um, Alan Moore. Alan Moore. Frank Miller. Frank Neil Gaiman. Like, wow. Like, I would collaborate with those wow. guys and then whatever whatever they had in mind alan moore neil gaiman frank, frank miller, miller. Yeah. i've talked to two of those three they're great great interviewers great fun uh alan moore maybe one day you know oh sure we know uh yeah. Har harvey Picar's widow joyce brabner knows alan moore so uh it, there may be a way for you yeah oh yeah i'm not worried yeah yeah but uh you know, so, it, and by the way, I always, I've asked this of a lot of creators, because if you're uh, any, a, a fan of any particular kind of music, often you listen to that music to fire you up, get you inspired. Did you listen to hip hop while, did you have it banging while you're creating Hip Hop Family Tree? And, and, and what do you listen to in creating X-Men, uh, your version of X-Men? I did listen to a lot of rap music yeah. while putting Hip Hop Family Tree together. Yeah. Um, with with X-Men, I consider it to be kind of like a, a true epic. Yeah. So this is how I discovered, you know, the Game of Thrones audiobooks and, wow. and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just a lot of podcasts, just a lot of a lot of fiction, a lot of um, you know, I'm going through Stephen King's body of work yeah. uh, while while I'm working. The, you know, audiobooks. Yeah. Man, because yeah. I if I'm awake I'm putting that pencil to paper. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man. And that gets you that gets you going. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I think that uh, one, one last question for you is, do you remember, to, must, many of us remember the first time we saw something on a page that awakened us to the miracle of what could be created on a page, whether written, drawn, do you remember what sort of, what was that thing for you? I, I do, and it wasn't a particular drawing or words or anything, it was the credits box yeah. on an old X-Men comic wow. with, with the name Chris Claremont, writer, yeah. Dave Cockrum, penciler, wow. you know, Joseph Rubenstein, inker, yeah. and this is before I even knew uh, how to read words, wow. and I asked my mom, what is this? Yeah. And she says, okay, this is the credit box, these are the people who made the comic, and yeah. I thought, oh, people make this. Yeah. And the that, human hand makes this comic, yeah. that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. And that raised the curtain on what you're doing. With that, we will close the curtain here Thank on, you guys. On, on, with Eddie P., the great Eddie P., the Eisner-winning Eddie P. Yeah, so good. Thank you.